Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video response now to Raymond and some really interesting comments he left on my channel on the recent video on philosophy of David Icke and book Everything You Need to Know But Have Never Been Told. And I would recommend you to go back and actually read those comments in full uh, because he phrases things much better than I would be able to uh, paraphrase in this video. But I'd like to respond in particular to the distinction between limitation and domination. Now, David Icke more or less uses those terms interchangeably because he defines being as infinite consciousness. Any limit on that is not real and is a form of domination. However, I think that David Icke's equivocation of these terms is problematic because in my own philosophy, in which being is limitation, I still consider domination to be something illusory. I would describe it with much of the terminology of a simulation, which David Icke also uses, and yet for me, limitation is exactly the meaning of being. Now, because it wouldn't be possible to explain such a maybe unusual understanding of things within, say, a very long YouTube comment, I notified Ray that I would have to do a full video. Now, much of this is because the ideas I'll talk about in this video are spread out both among the five books I already have uh, published and the sixth book that I'm currently writing. And in fact, the sixth book is supposed to be something of a synthesis of all of my own ideas into one uh, single text, uh, something of like my big work of original philosophy, which in a certain sense, each of the previous five books started out as an attempt to write hermeneutical death. It just morphed into some other project in the process. You know, you uh, focus specifically on Kaczynski to the point where you write a whole book on him or Linkola, that's what also happened. But in this text, I will actually do that. But I'd also like to provide a video in which I answer the question I've gotten since like 2012 with my first channel, People would say things like, okay, so you have videos on Zizek and Heidegger, but what do you think? Well, this video I'll actually tell you, but I'll start by talking about how technology has uh, largely been defined by the great anti-technological thinkers in negative terms. You may have noticed that for Kaczynski, for example, technology is the end of freedom because it's the end of nature. For Elul, technique is the end of spontaneity. It's the replacement of spontaneous forms with strict technical forms aimed at maximizing efficiency, which leave progressively less and less room for subjective interpretation until the subject just disappears. For Julius Evola, mechanization is a sign that something has gone wrong in the spiritual realm. You have the proliferation of machines precisely when the spiritual forms of the world of tradition become hermeneutically inaccessible. That's when even man himself becomes nothing more than cannon fodder for machines, such as in World War I. Linkola similarly defines uh, technology in negative terms as the ecologically impossible object. This is the object which is not so much a possible positive something as it is a term referring to uh, a situation which can never actually be fully realized. You have this project of universal automation, which can never be completed, but you can still waste resources trying to build it up. You have the dream of universal sanitation, um, universal suburbanization. We can't actually do these, but we can still embark on a suicidal quest, which will eventually end in human extinction if it is not stopped precisely because the laws of ecology forbid these things from being completed. Then, of course, there is Heidegger talking before uh, really any of these guys about how uh, uh, modern technology is the end of the question of being. If you reduce everything, including man himself, to standing reserve of material to be stockpiled and then summoned to an industrial use on a moment's notice, that is when being abandons the scene and you're no longer able to question it. For John Michael Greer, even talking about technology in the singular is already problematic because you don't have technology, you have technologies, and you have the choice to use some of them, even if they're outdated, especially ones which fall into the category of tools rather than prosthesis. A prosthesis replaces an ability. Um, for example, a wooden leg is useful if you don't happen to have a leg for one reason or another, but a tool doesn't do that. It extends an ability. And therefore, the tendency for uh, technology in the singular to largely fall into the category of things which uh, negate your personal abilities and simply uh, signal a euphemism for 
a demand by some corporation that you buy only the latest pro product they are marketing, uh, they are advertising to you, even if it is less satisfying, more expensive, and less functional than an older one you found perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly useful before, is the negation of subjective freedom. John Zerzon similarly defined technological alienation as simply the end of presence, and presence is what you have in the anarcho-primitivist context of hunting and gathering. In other words, if you're not living as a hunter-gatherer, you don't have that type of being. Therefore, all of these guys basically agree that technology is something which is the end of something. It's a catastrophic break in the order of being, even if they disagree what that being is. I also provide an answer that technological domination is the end of something, but for me it's hermeneutics. You're likely, however, to misunderstand what I mean there if you assume that I mean hermeneutics in like the usual sense of linguistic interpretation. But of course for me, hermeneutics is ecology, and that in turn is something I understand differently than how it is usually thought of. And to explain this, I have to show you the six deep memes. Now, these are six underlying shapes which a subject living within a specific um, ecological context really will embody whether that person realizes it explicitly or not. In our worldview, which is the fossil fuel worldview, because fossil fuels are the crucial limiting resource of that worldview, in other words, they're the limit of it, um, rather than just one object among many, the underlying shape, or the deep meme, if you will, is the ascending arrow of progress. Now, we have this intuitive sense that anything has to embody this logic of progress, or it will be dismissed as not even real, even though this only makes sense in a world of fossil fuels. For example, we have the expectation of social mobility. Everyone should have a better job than their parents, more money than their parents, more education, whatever. Even though that's not really true, um, we still expect that it should be true, but that is simply a euphemism for our phenomenological awareness of the structural features of fossil fuels, which is a massive return on the investment you take to harvest them, at least at the beginning, a ratio of something like 200 units of energy return for every one invested. That, of course, only makes sense in the fossil fuel worldview. In the hunter-gatherer worldview, the underlying shape is not the ascending arrow of progress, it is the level plane of reciprocity. You have the naturalization of culture. You don't have a word for religion. Uh, yours is simply the truth. You don't have a word for your tribe. You're simply the people. And you also have a personification of nature itself. You treat animals, plants, meteorological forces, seasons, etc. as people to be influenced with ritual. With the shift in crucial resource, or limit if you will, to uh, giant fields of grain with agriculture, you have the agrarian circle. The underlying shape now favors completeness over open-ended progress. It favors predictable repeating cycles over the constant novelty for its own sake. After fossil fuels, it's been speculated, the crucial resource or limit will be salvage materials. These are things which can no longer be produced outside the fossil fuel worldview, but which are still there and which can be repurposed even for uses the original designers could not have imagined. The shift at the memological layer will therefore be to the bell curve. The bell curve is, of course, isomorphic to the mathematics of peak oil itself. You have a gradual climb, a peak, and then a decline. And therefore, it is the only deep meme which is explicitly about decline, as looking back to the past is something which will not happen again, but which you still live with the effects of. And that is indeed a memological metaphor for the resource of the salvage materials themselves. In my later work, uh, Hermeneutics of Ecological Limitation, I identified two more deep memes in addition to these four I had in my first couple works. These are the nomadic set in which the crucial limiting resource is like flocks of sheep, uh, herds of camels, etc., in which you have the, the shape of a set because those are mobile herds which move over vast tracts of land, and therefore, something is understood to be a member of the set regardless of geographical location. You have this continue even out of 
uh, place of the um, in other worldviews, I should say, even if you switch to agrarian or fossil fuel modernity, you can have this continue as a pseudo meme. In the Vatican, for example, if you're a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you have to pay your taxes to the Vatican, even if you live in Australia or South Africa or Brazil, whatever, because you're a member of the set, right? And the final one I identified was in the uh, Herbert. Uh, novel Dune, the crucial resource is water, but because it's an extreme desert planet, this is water understood as vapor, in which you understand uh, your world through the shape of uh, something which evaporates quickly. You have the themes of preservation and scarcity and responsible use of resources and aversion to waste, the exact opposite of the fossil fuel worldview, in other words. Therefore, the ontology of limitation follows from this, but in five layers of consciousness, which you can shift among once you learn how to identify them. And to show you how this works, we'll just use uh, fossil fuels as an example. In each of the following layers, the object you are conscious of is oil, but each has a different form of manifestation. In the mythic layer, for example, petroleum is disclosed in the form of a narrative event. This is the American dream, um, the idea in India anyway that anyone could become rich just by moving to America. Um, in America, it's anyone could become rich just by going to college. Um, the idea of the universal middle class, the only way anyone should live is uh, suburban sprawl, the $500,000 mortgage, uh, three SUV uh, with car payments, $100,000 in student loans, medical debt, blah, blah, blah. Basically, you should be uh, up to your eyeballs in debt and wasting energy uh, for the hell of it. That is, however, just a euphemism for the presence of fossil fuels. It is true only because they still exist. It will not be true once they are gone. Of course, you can also shift to the Gnostic layer of consciousness in which now petroleum is disclosed once again in the form of a system of values with a definite logical ranking. The Google algorithm, for example, is two billion lines of artificial intelligence, but simply reiterating the logic of infinite progress and growth. Economics does this even more explicitly with the pseudoscience of how to get infinite growth on a finite planet with also only so many resources. Um, finance tricks people into paying back uh, an infinite amount on a finite debt by obscuring it in mathematical formulas which simply reiterate the presence of fossil fuels. The countersense object layer um, it differs by explicitly disclosing petroleum in the form of an object, albeit one which is self-contradictory. A student loan is a bottomless pit. A machine promises progress by becoming more efficient at burning fossil fuels. But of course, you won't get progress if you do that. You'll get resource depletion. It doesn't make sense. But a barrel of uh, 42 gallons of oil and uh, crude oil itself is actually itself a countersense object. This is an object which promises infinite progress in something which is clearly limited to 42 gallons. And it is therefore something which somehow can only manifest if fossil fuels are already given at the level of presence. The memological layer underlying these is petroleum disclosed in the form of the shape of an arrow, which never stops progressing. This underlies all of them. And then the somatic layer, petroleum is disclosed as the raw presence, which underlies each of these higher order meanings. Each one of these is true today only because this condition of somatic presence is still um, uh, satisfied. Of course, this leads to the question of a material ontology. For Aristotle, this is the question of material cause breaking down to the four basic elements as he understood it, earth, fire, uh, water, and air. For Husserl, material ontology is no longer a set of elements as it is a set of regions. You have um, all of those uh, all of those elements Aristotle gave as examples of the same region of physical objects, but that is not the only one. You also have um, the ability to be conscious of things like psychic acts, which have a different form of manifestation. You have the ability to be conscious of laws, uh, etc. And therefore, for Husserl, it's a set of disconnected regions rather than a, a single uh, a tree with a common trunk, if you will. For Haig or myself, it's a question of 
composite essences. In other words, I also accept something like a material ontology of types, but these are in all cases except one given composite in, in a, a combined form, if you will. Consider within the agrarian worldview, for example, that in the mythic layer, you are not only conscious of the somatic presence of grain, you are also conscious of a pneumatic or spiritual absolute. Julius Evola mentions that in the world of tradition, the story of uh, King Arthur and the sword and the stone, of course, it had parallels in Persia and Greece. It was not only King Arthur, that was just one instantiation of this broader myth in which, although we would consider that to be nothing more than good entertainment today, in the world of tradition, they saw a spiritual absolute disclosed regarding the question of the legitimacy of rule. In the Gnostic layer, you also have something beyond the somatic disclose. You have a Gnostic absolute, such as a number. Um, if you take a system like uh, Descartes' uh, system of mathematics, you can disclose the number three, although he treats it as an innate idea. But you can also disclose the number three within the Platonic system that treats it as a form. You can disclose it within a modern mathematical system. Any system, although they are um, not compatible with each other, you can still get access, albeit incompletely, to, uh, incompletely, to the Gnostic absolute of a number. You also have grammatical universals, as you find in, say, the universal gram uh, grammar of uh, things like the locality principle, instantiated both in uh, pronoun reference and um, within uh, rephrasing questions, etc., as I mentioned in my fourth book. Then you also have the forms of logic. Okay? And in the agrarian worldview, you could have Euclidean geometry as a, an example of a system which satisfies the somatic criteria of uh, large fields of grain, but also somehow gives you access to that Gnostic absolute. Then you have the counter-sense objective layer, or in the um, agrarian worldview, just the sense objective layer, in which you also have a, an ergonic essence disclosed. This is some process of work that allows you to discover the body. A blacksmith hammer allows you to discover your own body by actually uh, embodying a meaningful process of work, but it also reduplicates the values of the particular somatic worldview of the agrarian circle. In the memological layer, you also have a composite essence. You have the disclosure of a shape of consciousness, and that is what we might call a mentatic essence. The mentat in uh, Herbert's Dune is a thinker who is not a robot. We could say that somebody is not a robot if they can, are capable of having a deep meaning, in this case, the circle. And of course, the somatic layer is the only pure essence. It is not mixed with another one as these other four are. That is simply the disclosure of the presence of the soma or the body which is present um, as such. Therefore, you have to talk about an ontology of limitation. You have, however, different types of limitation. You have transcendental limitation, which is the conditions for how any of these layers must appear within that, or any of these contents must appear within that layer. For example, a myth can appear, but only as an event. A system can appear only in the form of a set of values. An object can appear, but only as form. A deep meme can appear, but only as a shape, and the soma can appear, but only as presence. If you change um, one of those conditions, you uh, move out of that layer as such. For example, in the realm of transcendent limitation, there's a form for each of these, which it tends towards overcoming its own limitations. But once it does so, it ceases to be what it is. For example, a mythic event is limited by its ambiguity. Uh, poetic interpretation is, by definition, unclear. I'd give 28 students the same poem, they will each give you a slightly different interpretation of it. But when the mythic event actually does overcome its own ambiguity, it simply becomes the value from a system. A system is similarly limited by its own inconclusiveness. You have many different mathematical systems, none of which is perfectly conclusive in the sense that uh, Russell or Hilbert, for example, dream that they might be able to make one. But when it actually does overcome its inconclusiveness, it simply becomes an object. 
the object similarly seeks finer grades of purity. But when it actually gets it, it simply becomes the deep meme. The deep meme similarly seeks the presence, but when it does, it simply becomes the soma. This is a little bit like Hegel talking about how, you know, when um, art really becomes art, it just becomes religion. When re religion really becomes religion, it simply becomes philosophy, etc. It's a little bit like that, but of course, there's significant differences between emphasizing negation and dialectic versus emphasizing limitation and hierarchy, as I mentioned in my second book, In Much Greater Depth. But that is not the only um, other type of limitation. There's also the imminent limitation, which is simply the existential subject itself. You have the disclosure of any one of these layers, but you have the subject to whom it appears. That subject, who is not any of the elements, but somehow still appears with it, is simply the subject. But of course, talking about the existential subject is something you have to uh, distinguish, whether that is in the Sartrean sense of like, you know, the, the negative power of infinite freedom, or whether it's in the Dostoevsky sense of a subject who somehow becomes less free precisely when he just, you know, uh, makes the leap of faith of trying to force through some radical act in crime and punishment, committing a senseless murder for no reason does not actually make you free, although it is something of a, a leap into the darkness or stabbing in the dark or whatever at some uh, ra seemingly radical act. And therefore, the subject understood in existentialism must be limitation rather than infinite freedom negation and these other sort of cliches. Finally, there's the absolute limitation, which is the contingency of the soma itself. This is its possibility to not be. And fossil fuels demonstrate this perfectly, as we are depleting them out of existence. They are not an absolute substance which is indestructible. They themselves simply um, are disclosed against the ontological structure of absolute limitation. Okay? Therefore, if these ontological conditions are met, you get apocalypse. This is the Koine Greek term for a revelation. You have the uh, transcendental limitation, the conditions, how it must appear. You have the transcendent limitation. Um, for example, the myth is not the, the value. The value is not the object, etc. And you have the imminent limitation, which is the subject, etc. If you have those satisfied, you have a revelation. But what happens if you don't satisfy these con uh, conditions, except that the real apocalypse is that the apocalypse might fail to happen. Modern technology, in Ted Kaczynski's sense of the term, is not one more somatic phase among all the others. Robots do not have deep memes because there is none disclosed in this context. And what you have instead is a technological simulation which destroys the possibility of manifestation in this sense itself. For example, with the rise of smartphone zombies, you have the event, which is not really an event, because any element of subjective interpretation is squeezed out. You have a system that is not a real system, because rather than provide access to the Gnostic universal of number, for example, you have pseudo-numerical uh, signatures, which are really just redundancies of uh, discharge of electricity within a machine. You have the countersense object that is no longer an object. Even the logic of progress is no longer seen in the device because the device itself vanishes amidst the simulation which pixelates on it. The memological bias that is no longer subjective. There is no deep meme there. There is no shape for the type of technology which is overriding our world. It simply turns you into the opposite of the mentat described in Dune. It's the presence which is no longer somatic. It can no longer really be described as the crucial resource or limit so much as it is something which is precisely so empty because it is so excessive in a very strange sense. And therefore, we're not talking about soma, but rather the objective factor in Kaczynski's sense of the term. And his emphasis on dependence in which other factors are dependent on the objective factor, that is how it gets that status, is much like what David Eck would call domination. And yet you could see that this is the exact opposite of limitation and in fact the destruction of it. 
However, because we have an intuitive sense that limitation is being, we can be tricked into attributing being to something which seems to be limiting us, but which does not actually fit the structures of limitation as I outlined them earlier. Domination is simply the destruction of those structures, and the true apocalypse is precisely that the apocalypse will not happen. This is not unique to modernity, however. Just as Oswald Schwengler called pseudomorphosis a given cultural form which did not organically develop within the civilization in which it's being used. For example, you have um, neoclassical architecture in modern contexts, and you're basically just borrowing it from ancient Rome, etc. A pseudo-meme is a deep meme which is imposed by force, rather than emerge from the soma within a specific ecological context itself. For example, as I mentioned, the Vatican continues to enforce the nomadic meme of the set even in agrarian and fossil fuel contexts. In this case, you embody the logic of being a member of the flock, not because you are actually phenomenally logically, uh, phenomenologically aware of uh, flocks of sheep, herds of camels, etc. Rather, it's because a figure named the Pope is dominating you to do so, and I do not mean to offend anybody by this observation, which is tr equally true of, say, the Pharaoh of Egypt exercising the same uh, nomadic meme of the set in an agrarian civilization, etc. In either case, you have the negation of limitation as the technical means to enforce domination, proving these are two different things. This mismatch in which experience cannot flow organically but must be artificially constructed by some external source is the true criteria to distinguish the two. However, this leads you to ask, what happens when you no longer have the deep meme at all? Technology is not one more, excuse me, pseudo-meme like what happens in the nomadic um, uh, set being enforced in the Vatican or by the Pharaoh. Rather, technology is the destruction of any meme whatsoever. Technology also poses a different kind of problem, since a subject with a pseudo-meme still has to fill in hermeneutical gaps. Those don't disappear in the, um, in, in the Egyptian context, for example. But with technology, the gaps disappear altogether. You no longer have the transcendent limit beyond technology. You no longer have the transcendental condition telling you consistently how to manifest as event, value, form, shape, presence, etc. You no longer have the imminent limit of a subject who has to take up the burden of hermeneutical interpretation, and you no longer have the absolute limit of ecological contingency, one worldview among many. This is because once the limit is overstepped, it ceases to be interpretable at all. A Dostoevsky novel to Kindle is only as interpretable as the algorithmic pr procedure tells it how to pixelate this content on a screen. That is both the perfection in one technical sense of interpretation, but also the destruction of it at the same time. Therefore, if you look at the history of systems, something really does change in our context relative even to the uh, uh, thousands of years in the past. For example, each of the following are legitimate examples of Gnostic systems in which the subject can appear as an imminent limit within a field of disclosed values. And metaphysical systems in the ancient and medieval world, for example, Thomas Aquinas' Middle Ages, every object has a meaningful essence defined by its part within the whole of the universe as it was designed by God, the ultimate conscious knower. Even in this context, the subject can still appear as imminent limit with a hermeneutical duty to interpret. In transcendental systems from Kant onwards, Objects have meaning in accord with the transcendental structures of the subject itself. You have the categories, regulative ideas, space, time, etc. Subject can still appear as imminent limit. Within formal systems, Frege, Russell, etc., the subject is somehow outside of a uh, logical system which has become much more independent. But the subject still has what they call the psychological power to think. They still has the need to take up a hermeneutical burden to think that system even if the system is bigger than any one of us. 
However, with modern technology, there's no need for any ecological context to determine how the system manifests itself according to the logic of a crucial resource. There's no longer the logic of the woolly mammoth, the herd of camels, or the fossil fuels, for you're dealing with pseudo-mathematical constructs which have no need to appear to have a conscious subject at all. Execution within hardware components actively replaces contemplation within consciousness. And therefore, more specifically, modern technology is the end of being because it has no regional essence, no somatic, pneumatic, gnostic, ergonic, mentatic, none of these essences are the one of modern technology, nor somatic combining with any of them. Lacking any material ontology is simply a simulation devoid of being, but I mean that in the most precise sense, as in it has no region. Likewise, no longer is there any transcendental isomorphism from one layer to another. In other words, the mythic event has to be isomorphic to its underlying deep meme of progress, which has to be isomorphic to its underlying somatic presence. You have this chain of transcendental isomorphisms, which are at work even if you don't realize it. But with modern technology, you don't anymore. In an ordinary context, you have a transcendent isomorphism in which you can get a, a window into a real essence. Evola laments that spiritual absolutes are no longer hermeneutically accessible outside the world of tradition. Euclid, uh, trying to gain access to the absolutes of uh, geometry and mathematics with a finite human mind, uh, Galileo trying to grasp even the truths of science as well as Isaac Newton in a way which a modern um, uh, company simply generating stuff on an ad hoc basis would not care about. And of course, Linkola lamenting the death of the Finnish body as we no longer do any freaking work. It has disappeared uh, precisely through not being used. There is, um, in modern technology, only the imminent isomorphism, in which case what you are dealing with is simply the reduplication of a discharge of electrical energy from one ad hoc engineering design to another, the window to the transcendent truths which Euclid, Evola, Galileo, Newton, and Linkola cared about is closed in the process. The subject of technology is therefore no subject at all. The metaphor of the robot killed by a self-driving car is a metaphor for what they basically want us to all become. Machines at the mercy of other machines. Likewise, the real problem with David Icke's thought is that because he identifies even sensory experience and physical reality as simulations, he is forced to define being as infinite consciousness and to therefore posit any form of limitation as itself a form of domination, ultimately by the elites in disguise. The reptilians are not higher forms of consciousness with more being than we have, therefore, but they are the ultimate negation of it, in that the reptilians are the hive mind which negates individuality in favor of ritual, conformity, and superstition. This is why technology is almost always associated with the reptilian mindset in David Icke's work. It is a form of domination which blots out freedom and individual individuality precisely by limiting us. This, however, misses the point that limitation is being, and domination is the negation of limitation rather than a synonym for it. In fact, technology simply is the ultimate form of domination in that sense. Therefore, far from being infinite, the subject itself is merely one more structure of limitation disclosed within a specific manifestation of some layer of meaning within a determinate somatic slash ecological context.